your monitor still blank? They are. Looks like they're working on it. We can turn around if we have to. There we go. Can you see it okay? <clears throat> um, gentlemen, thank you for, for that. Um, Jonathan was kind of covered for me while I was trying to get my laptop working. I appreciate that. <clears throat> the engineering department, as we talked a little bit earlier, does a lot of things. I thought I'd start off. You know, what does the engineering department do? Um, you know, we design, manage, and guide the construction of our built environment while promoting quality and safety to all that visit, live, and conduct business within the boundaries of the city of Enterprise. That's our, that's our mission statement. Last council meeting, there was a lot of discussion, but the main council um, action that was taken was approximately 300 acres of property, five different parcels or landowners, rezoned to an M2. I want to start off this whole thing by saying, to date, there is no plan submitted in. So I'll talk about what the process is towards the end of this presentation, but to date, there are no plans submitted to the engineering department. That means no site development plans, there's no construction plans, there's no details for any kind of facility um, that's been submitted to engineering for review for anywhere near the corner of Moats and, and Alabama Highway 84. So why am I here tonight? Well, there was a lot of discussion that came out of that discussion last week about <clears throat> more than just what was in the council rezone, which was the action that was taking place. Some of the things that I noted as I took notes down were, that came from the public, were chemicals being used in manufacturing, namely formaldehyde, a focus on public safety, the location of that M2 adjacent to a residential, primarily turtleback subdivision, increased vehicular traffic and truck traffic, and air quality issues were some that I noted that the public brought up during that rezone public hearing. So what I try to do was to take those issues and try to do a little due diligence and come back to you tonight and kind of to address what I could address, even though we haven't had any kind of construction plan submitted, but for those issues that are there. M2, which was what the property was rezoned to, this is straight out of our zoning ordinance. It's a district that includes land considered for appropriate for manufacturing or assembling of operations that tend to require substantial inputs of raw materials and components and subsequent shipping of processed goods. And there's a bunch of zones on the left. You can see the table, but that's straight off of our zoning map. The existing distance of turtleback, and I, I don't have a pointer, but you can see it in the upper left-hand part of that turtleback. Currently, before this rezone, there was an M2 area designated where HSAA is roughly 330 feet to the east. That orange star that I put on the map there is approximately where the phase one HSAA plant exists. The rezone property, which is down near the bottom where that red, longer red arrow, and I ovaled it to show up on the map, is roughly 5,600 feet from the area of which <clears throat> I would anticipate if something like this were to come, the site would exist. It's close to this Moats Road that runs left to right, that runs right into that B3 zoning, and this 84 that runs diagonally, top left to bottom right. So as far as the location of the site being close to Turtleback, I just want to point out there was M2 zoning currently that was not part of the action of last week that was only 300 feet, approximately 330 feet, to the east of the backside of Turtleback. When you look at the timing of the turtleback subdivision, I went back and pulled the preliminary plat and the final plat. The preliminary plat is when the developer comes in and says, this is what I would like to build in concept. In 2000, and, I'm sorry, 2005, the preliminary plat was submitted into engineering and approved. In 2008, the final plat was approved. At, when the final plat is done, that's when the, subdiv the, the subdivision exists and the developer can go in and sell lots within the subdivision. I want to point out that HSAA phase one was constructed in 20, 2004, a year before the preliminary plat for Turtleback even existed. 
when we talk about traffic concerns, <clears throat> I want to point out a couple of things. As you look at Alabama Highway 84, it is a grass median divided highway, four lane highway. And I pulled off directly off of ALDOT's page what the traffic counts were. There's a, there's a node um, just south of Moats Road, but relatively close. And those are average daily counts. 10,471 vehicles travel past that point on US 80, uh, Alabama 84. If you look on the other side of the bypass towards Dothan on 84, same buildup, same design criteria, same speed, same everything. Traffic counts currently, as of last year, are 21,000, close to 22,000 average daily counts per day. So you can see the same road section is currently experiencing about double of what the site is over on the Moats Road area. There's been a lot of talk about air pollution, um, air quality. So doing due diligence, <clears throat> I reached out and did some phone interviews with a couple people. Highlight those for you. One was a previous EPA region administrator. One of them was the ADEM director over all of ADEM. The ADEM air permitting office and their chief permitter. Um, and the last one was a Auburn University director of forest Products Development Center, as Dr. Vi, that's on the right. So I'll break down what we discussed and I asked a lot of questions and this is what I heard back. Under ADEM, if an OSB mill was to come in, <clears throat> they would require two major permits that ADEM would look for. Now, understand this is outside the purview of what the city would require. This is what an industry would require dealing with the state. So you have the, the federal EPA that sets guidelines, and then you have the state form of EPA called ADEM, Alabama Department of Environmental Management. They are to uphold the federal law and can be more stringent than what the federal EPA requires. So ADEM tells me there's two general permits that we should anticipate coming out of their office. One's a standard stormwater NPDES a permit. That's for most industries that are there. They control the stormwater run off the site to make sure that it's not polluting the surface waters of the state. The second is an air permit. An air permit would require EPA and ADEM limits that are, uh, that are required. It would require a desktop computer model. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And it would require facility monitoring. I'll talk more about that in just a second. So I asked them to dive in a little bit deeper on the air permit since that's one that I heard the most concern about. Um, the air permit they, they told us that they would look at would be one with a dust plan and would require a PSD permit in hand prior to equipment installation. ADEM considers that prior to construction. That term is a little different and is loosely done. Before construction of them means before anything permanent is put onto the site as far as equipment. You could still grade the site. You could still do some of the the rough grading, you could do some utility work, but you can't put any of the installation in until that permit is acquired and in hand. That permit takes approximately six months through the application process. Um, the permit requires uh, prevention of significant air quality deterioration that's directly off of their website. It requires a computer model that the plant must meet the standards. Now that model, I asked the question, is it a standard model? Is it everybody have their own model and it is an EPA related model, and they said typically the model is more stringent than what they experience in the field. ADEM recognizes the EPA's latest and most stringent hazard air pollution standards. That's something that um, he wanted to point out was they, they hold uh, industries like this to the highest level of the law that they can. And they said they may require through the air permitting process a public hearing, and I, I use the word may. I also talked to Dr. Brian Vi. He's a PhD at Auburn in the Forest Products Development Center. And a little bit of background about Dr. Vi. He, um, he's the director of the center since 2012. He has a BS in forest products. He's an MS in, in wood mechanics. He's a PhD from the Agriculture and Mechanics College. He has 24 years of industry engagement and experience, 14 years with three corporations, and some of the things he did, forestry, lumber, wood engineering, 
bio-based adhesives, um, and he's done extensive research at Auburn about adhesives that are used in the wood composites like OSBs and other composites. It listed everything from laminates to you name it. Um, to fit on the slide, I just said and other composites. I just want you to know this is not a standard what you would assume professor that you would get in class teaching um, maybe a core class. Dr. Vice said he has, he has inspected several OSB mills across not just Alabama but across the the southeast United States, he said there is no odor um, that when he experiences an OSB mill, the air smells fresh and it smells like cut lumber. Those are his words exactly. Um, he also said there's no report of bad community impacts. And when I say bad community impacts, it's people having to move, businesses having to relocate. Um, as far as an industry goes, he said it's one of the cleaner industries that you could have located in your community. Um, I wanted to back up by saying I was one of those people that made that trip to the lumber, um, to the OSB mill, just to get more experience about what an OSB mill may be, and that's exactly what I experienced. I experienced no odor. I experienced smells like fresh cut timber, like walking down an aisle at Lowe's or Home Depot. And it was a day that they were applying resins, they were pressing boards, they were cutting it. I was 10 feet away from those processes. The word formaldehyde comes up a lot, especially during these discussions. So I talked to him a little bit about formaldehyde. He said OSB mills may use phenyl formaldehyde. The short term for that is PF resin, or they may use something called MDI core adhesive. I'm no OSB expert by any means, but I was taking good notes. Um, environmental, risk is, environmental risk is low. Um, he says as far as things that could happen, he said that he considered an OSB mill as very low risk, no odor, and he also noted out that she had, no one's brought up, but they can use up to 1% wax in the process, so wax is part of this process as well. He named a couple places between him and the guys at ADEM that we were on the phone calls with. They told me to check out some of these facilities that are recent in the area, and I did so. One of them is Norboard, Alabama, and Lynette. Um, interesting thing about that is there is a, um, a Hampton Inn location about 1,200 feet from the gate of that plant. Uh, as you can see at the top right, that Hampton Inn. I thought that was interesting, so on my own, I called the, the hotel and I asked the question to the, to the lady at the front counter, have you had any problems there with the hotel? Is there any smells related to it? Have you had any negative issues or have you had any complaints from your customer base? And what she said, there's no reported odors, we can't smell anything, there's no negative impacts to the hotel, and we've had no guest complaints. And that's at that Hampton Inn right there. Another one they brought up to me, was West Fraser and Opelika Mills in Opelika, Alabama. Um, the interesting thing about this facility is if you look on the right, that's a screenshot from Google Earth. It's 1,600 feet from an intermediate school. It's 700 feet from a football stadium. It's 1,600 feet from South Union State Community College. And it's about 450 feet from housing developments. Um, it's surrounded on at least 180 degrees by schools and houses and residents. So I want to talk a little bit about phenyl formaldehyde resin um, and just, I guess it's the engineer coming out. I mean, want to research something. Um, PF is considered one of the products, one of the lowest cost adhesives for structural purposes. Why do they use it? Because it's a low cost adhesive for their process. It's highly durable for exterior grade, weather resistant, structural, thermosets. But formaldehyde, if you do a little Dr. Google and start looking up at some of the stuff that's available, formaldehyde is found all around us. Formaldehyde is found in glues, paints, caulks, dishwashing liquids, your cosmetics, detergents, air fresheners, and lotions. It's found all through wood products that you have in your home, probably that you're sitting in front of right now. It's in your clothing. It's in your vehicle exhaust. Water heaters generate it, tobacco smoke. 
even your human body emits formaldehyde at very low concentration. The largest man-made source for formaldehyde around us, if you could guess, combustible fuel out of your car exhaust, noted one of the largest formaldehyde producers in the environment around us. So the path forward, what happens? I started off by saying we haven't received any plans. We don't, no one submitted to us anything to review, but I want to be clear about what that process would look like. <clears throat> if they do, if the site is larger than five acres and or located on a major thoroughfare, which I would anticipate would trigger probably both of those if this were to come, they have to submit, the industry would have to submit a site plan review that comes in with the following items. General description of the proposal, site map with topography, standards for the development, their utilities, plans for protecting abutting properties. That is reviewed by our engineering department and final approval goes to the planning commission which they hold public hearings as well. If the site plan is approved and they move forward with construction plans, the construction plans are submitted to engineering and approved by the city staff, which is engineering, the fire department, and the water department. Also, permits might include public meetings, and I, and I put that as possible. I have seen that LDOT, if you have roadway access coming off of, a, a, of an Alabama highway, sometimes they have public hearings there, and then ADEM has gone on record as saying they may require public meetings as well with their air permit. One other item that I didn't put on the slide, but you know, it is law, it is city code that we cannot put truck traffic onto city streets. Truck traffic has to come on to a U.S. highway or Alabama highway, four-lane highway. So any truck access for this, we would be checking the box to make sure it accesses out to Alabama 84 and not to Moats Road. Um, with that, I want to be as transparent as I could with you and try to address as many concerns as I have heard. Um, and hopefully have some good conversation. I just want to give you a good staff report for what I have done since our last council meeting in two weeks. Council, any questions of, of Barry? Obviously, this won't be our, our last opportunity. Um, I think it was an excellent presentation. I appreciate all your research. I, I had a question. Uh, you mentioned computer modeling. You know, obviously, you, you can't, you know, the, the permit will be issued based on modeling because you you can't build the facility um, to to generate that. There's no way to replicate it without modeling. But uh, my understanding, and I, I believe you may have told me this, or maybe it was on, I was on a phone call with you and the, the ADEM staff, there will also be constant monitoring. So if it's modeled, the, 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 the permit is issued based on said models. But then there will be monitor, mo monitoring to make sure that they're holding to their models, correct? That is correct. ADEM tells me if they were to issue them an air permit, there's monthly inspections of all their equipment. There's continuous monitoring <clears throat> that has to go on for all the um, effluent air coming off the site. And they also are required to submit paperwork and all that ADEM reviews at least monthly, if not continuously, to make sure they're complying with the permit. Uh, the question I asked them on that phone call also was, one of the com comments that was made from the public was, it's cheaper just to pay the bill than not comply with the permit. Um, I asked that question to ADEM and I also asked it to uh, Auburn professor. And the comment I got back from both of them was the same, that it's very, very unlikely that a plant like this would not comply with the regulations of an air permit. Number one, they have to do it all ahead of time. It all has to be approved. It's in an EPA type software. It's not that you can make the numbers up. The software shows what has to be done. They install the equipment and is continuously monitored and checked monthly. Um, also, the PR recourse of someone not complying with that in today's market would be devastational for a business. But they said it's very rare, if ever, they've ever seen anybody not comply with an air permit. Mr. Mott, you, you answered, I, I believe, just about everything that Mr. Parker asked. Unfortunately, he left before you could give these answers, so I do appreciate you taking the time to touch on all those things. But um, I, I know in your presentation you mentioned about boards, the new press boards. He asked something about chips. Did you get any? 
So they're and for they're my chips. <clears throat> so in a in a typical meal type thing, there's not there's a different set of parameters for that. The most stringent requirements from ADEM would be for an OSB type facility. Um, so you know, a chipping facility would be where they just bring the wood in, create the chips. Now, uh, uh, the, the plant that we went and visited, they do their own chipping. They, they bring in raw timber logs on a truck, and they chip it down into pieces and create basically small coupons, you know, about the size of the palm of your hand and very thin, and then they orient those in one direction and lay the next and just cross cross those up with resins to press those things together. That's the way the plant did that we that, that I went to go visit. You know, how do they do it in other facilities? It it'll all depend on what gets submitted to us and what technology they're going to be using. Um, but one of the requirements, I'll tell you this, that the engineering department would look at before we made any recommendations, would be to make sure they have done all the appropriate permitting and requirements that the state and the federal governments require them before we would allow them to move forward with the construction in the city limits. One more thing, Mr. Mott, um, I think just about every one of us have been asked a hundred times about, is this a paper mill? Now we've answered, would you ask that? Well, <clears throat> um, the only discussion that I've been privy to is an o uh, someone interested in an OSB facility, not a paper mill. Um, ADEM did state if, you, if it was a true paper mill like what you've experienced in other parts of the state that gives you that, that stink, stench, smell, odor, whatever word you want to use, um, that is not what has been presented um, for discussion here. Right. Um, now, I'll tell you that it's, it's all been in dis discussion. You know, is it, have we received plans? Have we received any proposals? The engineering department has not. Um, but, you know, a facility like a paper mill, in my experience with those, they're typically located on large bodies of water. They're typically along rivers. Um, this site would, would not be a good site for a paper mill um, here in Enterprise. It's just because of the geography and the requirements it would take for a paper mill. Thanks for clarification. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had another question. You mentioned two facilities up in central east Alabama. I think one you said was in Lynette, being an OSB mill there, the, and then the other West Fraser facility there in Opelika. Just for clarification, I'm fairly certain that one in Opelika is a is a sawmill, right? Not a um, not an OSB facility, but um, similar processes. It's a similar process. It is the one in Opelika is a um, is a sawmill, yeah. not an okay. OSB yeah. mill. Yeah. For, okay. I just wanted to make sure that um, yeah. they that still we had were, some of the same permitting right. requirements, mm -hmm. some of the same transportation requirements, and that's why they asked me to look at yeah. those as similarities between. The but surrounding neighborhood. But the facility with the hotel within 1,200 feet of the of the guard shack was a that was an OSB, OSB mill there right that's off the interstate in in Lynette. I believe that's Chambers County up in central east Alabama, right? It, I'm not familiar which county that is, yeah. but that is an OSB facility. Yeah. Okay. 